following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. I would wake up and be deadly tired. A body fails for three years. I'm like, forget it, just let me die. Then came the diagnosis. That really hurt. ALS. Oh my gosh, it's gonna get worse than it already is. How he stared down a death sentence. It was around that time that my fingers were starting to crump up. And walked away completely healed. That's the moment I knew Jesus was real. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club and thanks so much for joining us. Russian soldiers are sabotaging equipment and refusing to carry out orders. While Russian President Vladimir Putin is being misled by his own advisors. That's what Western intelligence agencies are saying about the war in Ukraine. Britain's intelligence chief says Putin massively misjudged the state of his own military and the strength of the Ukrainian resistance. Now, with the war going badly, the people around him aren't giving him the full story. National security correspondent Caitlin Burke explains. A communications breakdown in Moscow could be keeping President Putin in the dark about the effects his war is having on Russia. New U.S. intel suggesting his advisors are afraid to tell him the truth. According to recently declassified reports, Putin is unaware that his military has been using conscripts or troops forced to enlist and taking heavy losses. He's also not getting the full picture of how economic sanctions are damaging the Russian economy. The fact that he may not have all the context, that he may not fully understand the degree to which his forces are failing in Ukraine, that's a little discomforting. The head of Britain's spy service now saying Putin badly miscalculated not only Ukrainian resistance, but his own army's readiness. He overestimated the abilities of his military to secure a rapid victory. We've seen Russian soldiers, short of weapons and morale, refusing to carry out orders, sabotaging their own equipment, and even accidentally shooting down their own aircraft. This new intel comes a day after Russia promised to scale back operations in certain parts of Ukraine, a pledge U.S. officials regard with skepticism. There is what Russia says, and there's what Russia does. We're focused on the latter. And what Russia is doing is the continued brutalization of Ukraine uh, and its people. Uh, and that uh, continues as we speak. The Pentagon does see signs of Russian troops withdrawing from Kyiv, but warns that movement is likely more designed to bolster forces in the eastern part of the country. President Biden spoke with Ukraine's president for more than an hour Wednesday, pledging another $500 million in aid and considering more sanctions on Russia. Here at home, the president reportedly considering releasing 1 million barrels a day from the nation's oil reserve to fight rising gas prices. As the war drags on, the number of people forced to leave their homes continue to grow. Today we crossed the four million mark. Um, I think it's a tragic milestone. Um, it means that in less than a month, or in just about a month, four million people have been uprooted from their homes, from their families, their communities, um, in what, what is the fastest exodus of, of refugees moving in recent history. Meanwhile, Ukrainian communities in the U.S. are preparing to help 100,000 expected refugees. In some cities with large Ukrainian populations, churches are mobilizing to serve as host families. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Well, the number of refugees topping 4 million is just a horrific number. When you consider the number of displaced persons, uh, that gets into the 6 million, 6 million number. I mean, these are... These are incredible numbers and there's incredible need. Ukrainian refugees are arriving at the Polish border tired and hungry. And Operation Blessing is there in your name to serve hot food to these weary travelers. Hi, so it's been a week since uh, we started uh, cooking here in Medica, right at the border with um, Ukraine on the Polish side, obviously. And so far we've been um, cooking hamburgers and hot dogs, quesadillas, making obviously some hot chocolate because it's really cold right now, some chai tea, 
just spreading the love of, of our Lord wow. Jesus and showing them that, you know, the world is here for them and we are here to care for them. Um, so I feel very excited. I'm very, very glad that we are having the opportunity to cook for these people uh, as many meals as we can daily. We as Operation Blessing feel very, very blessed to be here, obviously um, providing not just a warm meal, but a warm smile, just giving them the feeling of welcoming and, and complete safety. So I, I wanna thank you, everyone who's been a part of this mission, who's kept them in their prayers, everyone who's been here for not just us, but for Ukrainian people, thank you. Thank you for allowing Operation Blessing and our beautiful team to be here, spreading the love of Jesus through food. Thank you. And that thank you goes to you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that re relief effort. We're obviously mobilizing all our international resources. That disaster team is located out of Mexico City and they've gone to Ukraine. We're mobilizing resources right here in the United States. All of our European offices are being included in it. All the Orphans Promise Centers throughout Ukraine, throughout all the border countries, there's a map showing all the existing centers. Uh, Orphans Promise has been working in Ukraine now for two decades. CBN's been working in Ukraine for three decades. And these are all established outreaches uh, for orphans, for distressed families. And now all of those resources are being mobilized to help uh, the refugees, to help those who have been displaced by the war, those who are staying, uh, as well as those who are fleeing. If you want to be a part of this massive relief effort, all you have to do is call us and say, yes, I want to give. I want to be a part of the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief F Fund. Uh, there are a bunch of ways you can give. You can write a check and send it to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Just put Disaster Relief Fund on the memo line. You can text us now. You can text OB Crisis to 71777, or you can visit CBN.com. There's a place on the giving page where you can designate to the Disaster Relief Fund, or you can just call us. 1-800-700-7000. In other news, the Biden administration's proposal to drop a critical COVID policy could worsen the crisis on our southern border. Ephraim Graham has more on that story from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, the policy has limited the flow of asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border. Republican senators say the border is already out of control and Congress must take action to prevent a catastrophe this spring. Senior National Affairs correspondent Heather Sells reports. We're seeing an epidemic level of people coming across the border. Right now, Homeland Security encounters more than 7,000 migrants a day at the border. That's both illegally and at official crossings. And those numbers could spike if the Biden administration ends Title 42. It's public health order allowing the rapid expulsion of asylum seekers and those crossing illegally. The Border Patrol tell me that uh, if it is expires, without a plan being put into place to allow them to handle this volume of migrants, they will simply lose control of the border. The Biden administration reportedly plans to end Title 42 on May 23rd. Homeland Security predicts a, quote, significant increase in people arriving at the U.S. border when that happens. On Wednesday, a group of GOP senators warned that Good ending the everyone. order would overwhelm the Border Patrol, pave the way for more illegal immigration and drugs, and worsen an overtax system. There is a 1.5 million person backlog for dealing with asylum claims. 1.5 million. This means that when you are allowed into the country to await an immigration judge looking at your case, there will be anywhere from four to six years before your case is considered. Democrats like Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer have called for an end to Title 42, citing the country's pandemic recovery. Immigration advocates like Ali Narani agree, but warn that more infrastructure and personnel are needed at the border. Narani says that ultimately, the U.S. must undermine the cartels. The only people that are willing, winning right now are the cartels. If we actually had legal immigration pathways, people would not be relying on asylum as their only way to apply for uh, entry. And frankly, we would be taking away a very lucrative line of business from the cartels. 
Narani says there's reports that lawmakers from both sides of the aisle are talking about immigration reform. With a crisis clearly looming, perhaps Congress will act in time to avert the worst. Heather Sells, CBN News. COVID policies have put a damper on international travel for nearly two years. That includes travel to Israel, where for centuries believers have visited to find a deeper connection to their faith. Now that the doors are opening, those spiritual seekers are starting to return. Chris Mitchell met with one Christian group who recently made the journey. These pastors got the chance to visit Israel thanks to Eagle's Wings Ministry, a group focused on advancing biblical mandates such as spiritual community. We are so glad after two and a half years that we couldn't come back to the land to bring these pastors, almost 30 pastors from all over America, from the UK and from Canada, because we're living in a moment in the Christian church that we're reconnecting to the Jewish roots of our faith and standing in support of the modern state of Israel. And these pastors, I've been here a few times, but this particular time has really touched me, not only to, um, you know, to tap into my Christian roots, but really to tap into the Jewish roots. For these pastors, a chance to experience the land where the Bible comes alive. Honestly, it means finding history and bringing it to life for me. Uh, you know, we read the Bible constantly. I preach from the Bible. Over these past nine days, I've actually walked the Bible. At one point, the group gathered around a piano on the promenade and began spontaneous worship. I'm going to build my life on you. I'm going to build my life on you. I'm going to build my life on you. Pastors reflected on how this trip will enrich their ministry, especially first-time visitor Pastor Joe Reeser. It's planted a seed. It's made an impact. That, and I'm convinced of this, there's probably not an area of my ministry, my leadership, my future, my planning, my strategizing that is not going to be impacted by the influence of the land and the people and what God is doing, not just what he has done historically, but what he is doing through this place. The pastors are having their paradigms shifted. They're having their hearts softened and awakened. For years, Stearns has led the day of prayer for the peace of Jerusalem, and he says it's more important than ever. We believe that at least one day a year, the hearts of the global church should turn back to Zion, should turn back and, and pray for the, the coming of our king, the return of our king. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. A blessing to see the doors back open, ready to make the journey. Gordon? It is a blessing to see that. I know a lot of people want to go to Israel, and, and now would be a great time. Uh, as we come closer to Easter, we come closer to Passover, what a wonderful time to say this year, not next year, but this year in Jerusalem. Terry? Well, we are just a few days away from the final four. Up next, get an insider's look at what it takes to cut down the nets. The head coach of the reigning Nationals champions tells us the secret behind the most dramatic turnaround in college basketball history. And then later on, a hardened welder loses all the strength in his body. Before long, he had trouble even moving his fingers. Now, see how he was cured of an incurable disease. That's later on today's 700 Club. Well, March Madness enters the final stretch this weekend. A new national champion will be crowned Monday night in New Orleans. Last year's winner, Baylor University, well, they didn't make it past the second round. For head coach Scott Drew, it was one more twist in one of the most dramatic program turnarounds in college basketball history. Tom During has more from Waco, Texas. It's part of college basketball a title holder upset that busts the brackets of March Madness, sending the defending national champions home 46 times over the last 48 years with Baylor University now taking their turn. It's so hard to repeat because the next year you have so many obstacles. Here we've had to deal with a lot of injuries and not only are you taking everybody's best shot, you don't sneak up on anybody. Baylor head coach Scott Drew inherited a program under scrutiny and scandal in 2003, but he's taken on both the long build and the 2021 championship with profound perspective. 
Coach, what you've done here at Baylor has, is frequently described as the most dramatic turnaround in college basketball history. Two decades worth. <laughs> One consistent difference maker for you, what would it be? It's a God. And everything we do around our program is Christ-centered. The great thing is uh, we can prepare champions for life, and that's a spiritual, academic, character formation, and athletic. So for us to be able to incorporate the spiritual part has been so key and paramount to all our success, and he's blessed us. The program that you inherited, downtrodden, scandalized, mm -hmm. what was the feel of the program and the team? We only had between five and seven scholarship players because we worked things out academically. It was a walk-on stream because not only could you be on the team, you could actually play. When you're a 35 or 40 point underdog every game, you know that chances aren't great you're walking out with wins. And that first class helped form the foundation for what we're doing now and everyone that's come after. The road to joy, mm -hmm. for you, what is it? A road to joy, I think, really makes it a lot easier to understand Jesus, others, yourself. And if you're living with those priorities, uh, life is so much better for all of us. Winning a title that beyond joy? <laughs> it's the last time I've had an all-nighter in probably 30 years. It was an unbelievable feeling. You got to celebrate it. Why I coach, why so many people coach is to help people reach their goals and dreams, see them satisfied. How have you been transformed? How have you changed? Well, I think anything you do takes time to develop your craft. Hopefully I'm a better coach today. Hopefully I'm a better mentor today than I was back then. It takes everyone involved to be successful. A lot of our coaches have been here 10, 12, 15 years. It starts with a lot of love. Players don't care what you know until they know how much you care. We love them and try to get the best one. You've walked at that long process of building and waiting what kept you unwavering? I, I, I'm blessed to have great assistant coaches. And then my dad's a Hall of Fame coach. And when we were going through the first couple of years, he got me in the book of Job. And does Job ever end? Is it the whole Bible, you know? But it's, it's who you surround yourself with. Which lion are you listening to? Coaches like to control everything. And you know, when you're walking by faith, God's the one at the wheel. We try to do everything we can. We give our players our best try to go 1-0 and each and every day and see what God has in store for uh, us that day. Your reputation is as a remarkable recruiter. What does the soul of a student athlete today crave? Hmm. 27 years ago when I got into coaching, it was the coach's way or the highway. Nowadays, players, they don't want to be told, they want to know why. And if they believe in the why, then they'll do whatever uh, is asked or required. It's a Siri generation. They want to be informed, so the heart's so important. And if they're bought in with the heart, they perform at their, their fullest. When you finally earn that national championship, is there fault in clinging to it? Does it change you? Absolutely not. The day that I die and I go before God, he's not going to say, what's your record? How many championships did you win? So we're going to do everything we can. Thank goodness God sent Jesus for us. Hopefully we win the game of life, which is much more important than a trophy, a tournament, a championship. It's God's platform, and I just wanted to honor him. Coach, from the height of achievement, pride can be empowered. Does humility take a different look? Well, pride comes before the fall, so the great thing is in, in the Bible, the people God uses, the weakest clan, the smallest, so it's easier to stay humble than when you're not Samson or Goliath, you know? I know in our journey that bold's good for me because I know it's not what I've done, but what God's done. Competitor and Christ follower, what do they have in common? Both of them should be fearless in a race, run in such a way to win the prize. God doesn't call us to not try to use all the talents. We want to maximize what he's given us in a way that pleases him. Conviction and faith at a Christian institution, mm -hmm. it can become distant and stale. How do you keep the faith of your players active and authentic? It's like eating, you gotta do it every day. We start staff meetings in prayer, we start practice in prayer, we end practice in prayer. Players have players only Bible study. So it's constantly being fed. And at the same time, the great thing about college basketball, there's a lot of pressure. You're only as good as your last game. You're closest to God when you need him most. Uh, lessons for us all, whether that we're in a basketball tournament or just trying to get through the tournament of getting up and going to work today. It's wonderful to be fed. And the more you can spend time with the Lord, spend time in his word, spend time in prayer, it prepares you for everything in life. Terry? 
Well, up next, a man confined to a wheelchair stands up and walks for the first time in years. Watch him regain his strength and find out how an online article helped him beat ALS. Plus, we're going to be praying for you, so don't go away. ALS, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a crippling, incurable affliction. So when Tony Myers received that diagnosis, he just wanted to die. It was the capstone to a huge pile of bad breaks that Tony had to battle his entire life, beginning when he was just a boy. I was crap. I was dirt, mud, all that good stuff. And that's the way I lived my life. As a young boy growing up in a small Indiana town, Tony Myers never felt anyone could love him, including God. He just wanted to throw lightning bolts if you even stepped one little bit out of line. Raised a Catholic, he tried to hold on to some belief that God cared until two of his friends were killed in a car accident. The only way I knew how to deal with it was through the anger and through cutting myself off and through not caring. Because if there's a guy like that, I ain't serving him. Tony went on to serve eight years in the Army before taking a job as a welder. In all those years, he was still angry at God and the world and looking out for number one. I always looked at it like, you're out to get me, so I'm going to get you first. In my mind, I was the force. Then, at 39 years old, he met Deb, a Christian who saw Tony much differently. There was something about her that I never experienced. And she always said she saw gold in me in spite of my actions. <laughs> I wanted what was best for her, and that was very unusual for me. But a woman's love alone wasn't enough to soften his calloused heart. That same year, Tony started having symptoms that came without warning. I would wake up and be deadly tired, could not keep my eyes open. I would end up eating like every other day or something like that. I didn't care. I mean, to me, I'm just going to barrel through it. For two years, Tony kept getting worse. I'd get weak, just all of a sudden get weak, my legs my arms, just out of the blue. Still, he refused to see a doctor. It wasn't until a near-fatal accident with a co-worker in March 2009 that Tony decided he needed help. I'm holding this piece of steel, and all of a sudden, I could not hold it. It almost fell on his head. It was like, I can't risk another person's life. Tony went to several specialists, but none could find a cause. Eventually, he was forced to use a cane, and then he lost his job. I'd always been able to overcome everything on my own, and now I'm getting fired? That really hurt. And one night, he saw a preacher on television and made him think he might need Jesus after all. I mean, emotion hit me that I had never experienced. That's the moment I knew Jesus was real. But Tony still didn't believe Jesus could love him. Meanwhile, he and Deb married as he continued to deteriorate. Eventually, he was confined to a motorized wheelchair. I mean, I couldn't breathe. Speech was a huge problem. And it was around that time that my fingers were starting to crump up. Finally, after three years of testing, doctors concluded Tony had a fatal neurological disorder, most likely ALS. Oh my gosh. It's gonna get worse than it already is. So I mean, I was going through all, all the gamut of emotions all the time between fear and anger. And at that point, I'm like, forget it, just let me die. But on July 4, 2012, Tony was thinking about something very different. It was an article he had read about Jesus' crucifixion. 
I saw Jesus at the whipping post being scourged and just seeing chunks of flesh being ripped off. And in his eyes, there was a deep, a, a truly deep love that was unending. Jesus suffered far worse than I did and how much he had to have loved me then. And it was like I knew because he loved me that much, he wanted me to be whole. My anger just evaporated. Back pain be gone. It just came out of my mouth. All the pain left. What in the world? Then I said, fingers move. And then my fingers are moving. And then that's when I said, Jesus, don't let me fall. And all of a sudden, my legs hit the floor. Is this really happening? Wow, my Lord, my master, my God, you did this for me. Today, Tony is still strong, pain-free, and eager to share how Jesus' love healed his body and his soul. The fact that the Lord loved me in spite of me totally being set against him, he loves you as you are right now. And he sees you as the most precious thing on the face of this earth. You know, sometimes when we're struggling with various physical illnesses or needs, we feel left out. We, it's hard to believe God loves me. Sometimes we lose people that we don't understand wh why did they die? You know, there are a lot of people in the world who, you know, are doing terrible things and then sometimes the innocent are taken. And then sometimes when we harbor bitterness and resentment because of things that have been done to us in our lives, we're so angry inside, we're so locked up by all of that, that it's hard for us to believe or receive the love of Jesus Christ. I love Tony's story because it's such a picture of how God's love for us doesn't change based on us. It's, he's steadfast in that. It says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. It's new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Listen, God loves you right where you're at. You can't get good enough. You don't have to get good enough. But today, because you've heard Tony's story and you've seen that, just open your hands and your arms up as we pray today. Whatever your need is, God wants to touch you. He wants to be in your life. He wants to be real. He wants his presence to be in you and with you. Receive that today. We have all kinds of, of people watching who have specific needs. Just put all the doubt, all the anger, all the frustration behind you and receive as we pray today. I want to share with you an email from Carrie uh, she says, I've been suffering with neck pain for years from a car accident, and the neck pain is made worse by sleeping. It had gotten so bad that I decided to try and change my pillows to see if it would help. Well, on March 23rd, Gordon prayed for someone who's had ongoing neck pain made worse with sleeping, and they even tried different pillows. <laughs> I shouted with excitement and claimed that healing for myself. I ran into the kitchen to tell my daughter, praise God, I've been free from the neck pain and feel great. <laughs> Well, here's Melanie of Knoxville, Tennessee. She started itching terribly from a skin condition. For months, she tried one thing after, nothing, uh, after another, but nothing helped. Watching this show, Melanie heard Terry say, someone else, you're strugg struggling with rosacea for a long time, and you have other allergies as well. Right now, God is healing that condition in you. Just lift up your hands, breathe deeply, receive that healing, the skin conditions are being healed right now. Melanie claimed her healing 
and she hasn't itched since. Now, you hear this phrase, claim your healing, mm. and how do you do that? What does that mean? Well, Tony really described it. Here he is sitting in a wheelchair, and you heard him say, I should just go ahead and die because this is going to get worse, and I don't want to face that. So he's sitting in a wheelchair, and he looks to Jesus. He has a great revelation. Now, here's the promise from Jesus. I will manifest myself to you. That's what he did for Tony. And I'm here to declare to you, he will do the same thing for you. Now, Tony looked to Jesus. He saw him at the whipping post. He saw chunks of flesh being ripped from his body. And then he saw his eyes and he understood the greatness of his love. And in that, all of Tony's anger went away. In that, he found the peace that passes all understanding. In that, he found power to now speak to his own body, hand move, back pain be gone. Jesus keep me from falling, and suddenly his legs are on the floor, and he is standing up. He started speaking healing. I believed in my heart, and I spoke. Now, here's a verse for you. Faith works through love. When Tony saw the love, that's when the breakthrough happened, and he could believe and he could believe that he was the most precious thing in the universe to Jesus. He's the most precious thing. You are the most precious thing. He loves you tenderly. Look into his eyes. Look to Jesus, the author, the finisher of your faith. Claim his love. Claim it over your body. Claim his sacrifice. Claim what he's done. Claim what he accomplished on the cross. Claim it. Declare it. Believe it. We're going to pray. You agree with us. In an act of faith, lay your hand on that area that needs healing. We'll come into agreement with you. And Jesus will do what he's promised to do. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we see you. We see your sacrifice for us. We see that by your stripes we are healed. We see your precious blood shed for us. We see that we are crucified with you. We come to you and we ask now for healing, for forgiveness, for your amazing love to be poured out, to be shed on us. Pour out your love over us, Lord God. And now stretch forth your hand to heal and to restore and to straighten and to give life. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. There's someone you have a severe curvature of the spine and it's... Um, caused your left shoulder to hunch and there's a um uh it's like the whole thing protrudes out the back it, it's a humpback and uh god is just doing an amazing miracle where he's able to straighten all of that out he's able to undo all the damage he's able to give you mobility he's able to do this wonderful thing for you raise your hands to the lord god almighty and receive this wonderful healing all through your spine, it's being straightened right now. In Jesus' name, be healed. Terry? Yeah, some of you have a, I don't even know if it's a condition or just a, an unusual situation. You have like little cysts underneath your eyelids, and it's so uncomfortable. Um, you're actually seeing a doctor right now, but God's healing that for you. All of those things are going to just dry up, and you'll not have them anymore in Jesus' name. Now, there's someone crying out. You're saying, please say ALS. And so I'm saying ALS for you. 
In Jesus' name, be healed. What you just saw in Tony's life, you can have it too. Receive it now. In Jesus' name. Yes, someone else, you have a condition with your body like overheats, then it gets cold, then it overheats, then it gets cold. You, you're always uncomfortable because of this, not knowing how to dress, and it's just awkward. God's healing that whole part of your being now that, that, um, that moderates all of that. It's all going to be normal in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you're suffering. Uh, I just have this phrase, lesions in the brain. Uh, I don't know the source and the cause, but just for you, lesions in the brain, and you're wondering, you're questioning your own thoughts, you're questioning right now, can this be me? And it's you. Be healed now. God is able to heal brains and brain tissue. He's able to restore neurons. He's able to completely take that away. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole. And there's someone else, you keep having anxiety attacks, something you, you've not been used to in the past, but the world just seems overwhelming to you. And God, the peace of Christ is coming into your mind and your heart right now. Just lift up your hands and let all of that anxiety go and receive his peace in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love towards us. But while we're sinners, you died for us. We thank you for it. We receive everything that you have for us. Be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. If you've been healed, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. We're here for you 24 hours a day. We want to stand with you, agree with you, for the promises of God over your life. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Well, still ahead, how you can teach the power of prayer to your own children. The author of Raising Prayerful Kids shares fun and easy lessons that will last a lifetime. Don't go away. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. Tornadoes brought severe damage to the South Wednesday. In Jackson, Mississippi, a funnel cloud spotted moving towards downtown, forcing workers at the state capitol to take shelter in the basement. A large tree crashing down just outside the governor's mansion. At least seven people were injured when a reported tornado hit southern Arkansas. That storm system now moving into Florida and Georgia. President Joe Biden took a second booster shot against the coronavirus Wednesday. This week, the FDA authorized another round of boosters of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. The Centers for Disease Control saying they're important for people older than 65 and those older than 50 with underlying medical conditions. Wednesday, the administration also launched the website covid.gov, calling it a one-stop shop for vaccine tests, treatments, masks, and the latest information on COVID-19. Want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's cbnnews.com. Gordon and Terry are back with more today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Nahum had a huge mass growing on his cheek. It made it hard for him to eat and it made his gums bleed. And while he says it really didn't hurt, it did cause him pain in a different way. Nahum used to be outgoing, but after a large mass grew on his cheek, he kept mostly to himself. He often came home and told me kids at school and even teachers made fun of him. It really hurt his feelings. Some of my friends at school laughed at me. They call me Big Joe or say I ate something that was stolen. I struggle to eat and my gums bleed. The mass doesn't hurt much, but the teasing makes me miserable. We went from hospital to hospital, but we were unable to get him treated. We finally gave up because we couldn't afford surgery. All we could do was pray. He would somehow get help. Then a teacher told Nahum about a surgical program supported by Operation Blessing. 
They reached out to us and soon we arranged and paid for his surgery. In just 45 minutes, doctors removed a huge benign mass from his cheek. Now, Nahum is smiling once again. I feel good and confident again. People treat me like a normal person and I can go out without attracting any attention. My friends were happy for me and told me I look much better. To those who helped me, thank you so much. May you continue helping others. I am grateful every day when I see him looking happy and healthy again. Our prayers have been answered. May God bless you. Well, that God bless you goes all the way to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing to help people around the world. And I love supplying special surgeries for people where you can uh, give them a hope, a life, a future for people who can't afford to even see a doctor to come to them and say, yes, we can help. We can be a part of the answer to your need. And then in return, they give thanks to God for the people that made it possible. If that's you, if you want to be a part of this, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Just say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? It's $20 a month. We also have 700 Club Gold, $40 a month. Some people can give $1,000 a year. That's $84 a month. At whatever level, do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Call, say, yes, I want to pledge. I want to become a member. Now, when you do that, I've got a special gift for you. It's my father's latest book on the power of the Holy Spirit in you, where you can understand the miraculous power of God. It's over 60 years of ministry, uh, answering, asking and getting answers from the Holy Spirit of what to do, how to get direction, uh, what does God want me to do today? All of these things he's distilled down so you can benefit and you can have the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. I want you to have it. It's yours when you call and join. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, up next, we've all heard the verse, train up a child in the way he should go. What's the right way to do that? The author of Raising Prayerful Kids gives us the answer, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Well, in all the decades of biblical archaeology, there hasn't been a single discovery that disproves the Bible. In fact, it's the other way around. Archaeology supports the accuracy of the Bible, and you can see that for yourself in CBN Films' new documentary, Written in Stone, Kings and Prophets. For a gift of any dollar amount, we'll send you the wonderful DVD. You'll also get in, in, exclusive instant streaming access in 4K on the CBN Family app. So if you want it, just go to cbn.com slash written in stone, or you can call us 1-800-700-7000. And the reason we're asking for a gift of any dollar amount is we need funds to pay for the new production on how did we get the Bible. It's our new documentary called The Oracles of God. We're working on the Old Testament will be the first one, and then a we'll, uh, couple years we'll release the New Testament. We need funding for that, so that's why we're asking for a gift of any dollar amount. But the best part, you'll learn all the archaeology from Israel right now proving the accuracy of the Bible. So if you want it, Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, according to a Barna survey, nearly nine out of 10 parents recognize that they are the ones responsible for teaching their children about faith. And yet that same survey revealed that many parents feel ill-equipped to do just that. Stephanie Thurling, the co-author of Raising Prayerful Kids, is trying to change that. Author Stephanie Thurling acknowledges the weight of parenthood can feel heavy at times. It may even feel daunting to find time in your busy day to be intentional with your children about their faith. She says God can change your family through prayer. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. It can be fun and non-intimidating when you incorporate prayer into your child's everyday moments. In her book, Raising Prayerful Kids, Stephanie gives you simple and exciting ways to creatively and intentionally pray more often with your children. Well, Stephanie joins us now via Skype. Stephanie, thank you for being with us. 
Thank you so much for having me. You open your book sharing about a conversation you had with your friend Angela. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was after church one Sunday and our oldest kids, we both have three now, but at the time our oldest were kindergarten and she was a newer believer, Angela. She was coming to church, really starting for the first time. And we were picking our kids up from the childcare area. And she just said, you got to help me. Charlotte's asking me about these Bible stories. She's learning at church. She's asking me to pray. And I just don't know how, I don't know what to do. And so I started I didn't really give her a very good answer, but I started looking for some resources for her and didn't really find a lot. And I prayed about it and God said, make your own. And that's how this whole thing started. Wow. Well, you have a list of games that you can play with children. How do you play the grateful game? Oh, the grateful game is so fun. You just, it is the easiest way you will ever pray in your life. And you literally just say, thank you, God, for something. And you can go in a circle and go as fast as you can and not repeat yourself. Or you can say, thank you, God, for, you know, my juice box, because it's really delicious. Say why you're grateful. Or you can go in ABC order. And it's just a really engaging, fun way to praise God in any moment. We do it in the car a lot or waiting in line somewhere around the dinner table. It's just a great way to praise God with your kids. Love integrating gratitude <laughs> into their lives. Yeah. <laughs> yes. One activity that your children particularly enjoy is the nature walk. How do you incorporate prayer into that? We are just really passionate about incorporating prayer into things you're already doing with your kids. We know that parents have this huge influence on kids' faith formation, but parents do a lot. And so we love to be including God in everything we're already doing. And so if you're already going on a walk with your kids or going to the park or just playing outside, we like to just praise God for the things that we see. Our house gets some really beautiful sunrises. And so we always in the morning are just like, God, thank you for painting the sky pink and orange today. Or on our walk, we'll say, wow, look at how God made that beautiful flower, this beautiful sunny day. We just incorporate God and talk with God as we're outside. And it's really simple. You're also teaching your children how to spontaneously pray themselves. A lot of kids there in Sunday school or even in school recite simple like nursery prayers. I grew up with, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my yeah. soul to keep. What are your thoughts about these memorized prayers? I think memorized prayers are great, um, especially when you have a kid who isn't comfortable praying or doesn't really know what to say or maybe is a little perfectionist. Or a stubborn kid. I have a, a middle child who's really stubborn and he didn't want to pray for a really long time. No matter what I did, he would not pray. And so we started with the Lord's prayer and I helped him memorize it. And now every night before bed, we still recite the Lord's prayer together. And then he prays and I pray together. So I think memorized prayers are really, really great. They're a really good place to start. And it can be a great building block for getting kids more comfortable praying in a spontaneous way, like you said. The Lord's Prayer is a good place to start that. Yeah. How can a children perfect prayer? You can't go wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How can children practice all day prayer? Because practicing the presence of God is really something even we as adults need to work at doing. Yeah, I think one of the biggest concepts in our book is the concept of changing your language. And that's kind of, again, like the nature prayer walk, you know, instead of saying, wow, that tree is really pretty, you say, thank you, God, for that tree. So I think the more you model to your kids that God is everywhere and we can be talking about him and with him all of the time, the easier it is for kids to do on their own. Um, we do a lot of, if we're um, unloading the dishwasher, I'll ask, you know, someone will hand me a plate. And I'm like, who do we want to pray for as we put this plate away? And so we'll be praying even as we're doing chores or when we're driving and we see an ambulance, we stop and pray for whatever situation that is in or a car accident or whatever. The more you can model praying throughout the day, the easier it is for your kids to do it out loud or in their minds when they're older and in school, they can pray at school too. Yeah, they really are watching us, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> are. And listening. What a wonderful opportunity to raise yeah. prayerful kids. Raising Prayerful Kids, that's Stephanie Thurling and Sarah Holmstrom's book, and it's available nationwide. Thanks, Stephanie, for being with us. Bless you. Thank you so much. Gordon? Yeah, that's a wonderful book, a wonderful way to uh, approach your children. We leave you today with these words from Proverbs, which are also to, to be memorized for every pa parent. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
Well, for Terry, for me, for all of us here, God bless you, and we'll see you again tomorrow.